So we are living in times of, in interesting times. Remember the Chinese curse, may you live in an interesting time. Question is whether it's a curse or a blessing. See, it's a curse if you're afraid of change. It's a blessing if you can use change to free yourself from your identification with that which changes. See, I really see it as a blessing. I mean, I look at this body, which is now decaying at a deliciously interesting rate. I mean, you can almost notice it from day to day. You know, and there's all these big veins and wrinkles and little marks and spots and... I mean, this is beauty. If I look at it as a beautiful old hand, if I impose upon that all of my social structures, conscious, my conceptual things, about that's my hand, that means I am wrinkles and blood vessels. And look at how much I value the absence of wrinkles and blood vessels. Am I ready for this? Is there going to be anxiety now? Is this less beautiful? <laughs> So the question is, is change beautiful? Is what changes part of the beauty of nature? And are you part of the beauty of nature? And can you allow the changes and delight in them and look for the wisdom inherent in each change rather than resisting it? Can you work to preserve your body and at the same time be ready to let it go? Rilke says the most remarkable thing is to be able to hold death and continue to live. To be able to be at peace with the way of things by cultivating the part of yourself that isn't you anymore, but is, which has nothing to do with time and space, birth and death, coming and going, loss and gain, fame and shame, pleasure and pain. Which ones are you ready for? Somebody gave me this Xerox that says, if you are unhappy. Once upon a time, there was a non-conforming sparrow who decided not to fly south for the winter. However, soon the weather turned so cold that he reluctantly started to fly south. In a short time, ice began to form on his wings, and he fell to earth in a barnyard, almost frozen. Cow passed by and crapped on the little sparrow. The sparrow thought it was the end, but the manure warmed him and defrosted his wings. Warm and happy, able to breathe, he started to sing. Just then, a large cat came by, and hearing the chirping, investigated the sounds. The cat cleared away the manure, found the chirping bird, and promptly ate him. The moral of this story, one, it's got three morals. Everyone who shits on you is not necessarily your enemy. <laughs> Number two, everyone who gets you out of the shit is not necessarily your friend. <laughs> and number three, if you're warm and happy in a pile of shit, keep your mouth shut. So partly this decaying body and all of this and the ecological stuff and the trees and the this and the that and the violence and all, it's a pile of shit. Now, are you warm and happy? It's interesting as to whether you can be happy and then act or you will only, can only act in order to sometime be happy, to finally be happy. Like, I can't be happy unless all the loggers starve to death. <laughs> I put it in terms you won't like, of course. We all understand what the, that debate is about. I won't be happy until the social systems of which I'm a part are just. Now the question is, is my lack of happiness in the process a help to the realization of the goal? In other words, if I would like to live in a happy world, 
maybe what I could contribute is happiness. But if I set the condition, I can only be happy if I get a happy world. I mean, I go to truth, ra I mean, peace rallies, and I hope there'll be truth rallies sometime, but there are now. <laughs> there are now peace rallies, and there are such angry people at them. I can't believe it. Gotta have peace. Now. Uh -uh. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to know you, man. I'm going to be putting up my walls. I'm of the school that if this pile of shit isn't good enough, I'm in trouble. I'm in deep shit. <laughs> and can it be good enough and I can also work like hell to turn it into what I see as possible, a just and compassionate world? Are those incompatible? If you saw it as perfect, would you then not do anything? What would the perfection include? Would it include the truth of your heart? The truth of your heart is that when somebody hurts, you hurt. Because we're all us. It's interesting how you deal with suffering and the way in which you distinguish between your own suffering and somebody else's suffering. So you may get to the point in your spiritual work while where you don't invite suffering, when it comes along, you work with it. Because the only reason you're suffering is because your mind has attractions and aversions. Otherwise, it's just change. The value imposition has to do with the attachments of mind. But if somebody says, I want to be free of suffering, then I've got to help them be free of what they experience as their suffering. Even though I know that when they get free of that suffering, they're going to have another suffering. And what I would love to be doing is getting free of the source of the issue of suffering itself, the basic ignorance, which is what the Dharma is about. The Dharma is designed to get rid of the basic ignorance from which suffering arises, like a seed from which a plant comes up. And it's the ignorance, basically, of separateness. Not that separateness isn't part of the dance, but our identification with our separateness. That's where the source of the suffering is. Sorry. <laughs> Next lifetime you'll understand it. I think the game is to bear the unbearable with a giggle, with your heart breaking, and then do what you do. I think you should trust your inner wisdom that out of you would come actions not out of ought or should, but out of the essence of what is. If you distrust the compassion of your heart, then you have to get caught in the oughts and shoulds. If you don't distrust it, you just have to surrender into it and it will take care of it, what needs to be taken care of. The statement in the Tao, one does nothing and nothing is left undone. Meaning you're getting very tired being somebody doing something. And there's a whole other way of being in which you are the thing itself and whatever happens, happens. It's the compassion that arises out of emptiness. It's the discriminating wisdom. Did you see when you stop trying so hard to be good, to be right, to be just, to be compassionate? I mean, more violence is done in the name of being compassionate. Basically, everybody thinks they're good in one way or another. Very few people would think they're evil. To live with the uncertainty, to live with not knowing, with knowing you are living at the edge of the mystery all the time. You and I don't really know about death. Somebody handed me a, another, I'm going to live on people's handouts. Faith. Faith is when you have come to the edge of all the light you know and are about to step off into the darkness of the unknown. Faith is knowing one of two things will happen. There will be something solid to stand on, or you will be taught how to fly. Under that is a fortune cookie cartoon that says, 
which the fellow's asking the waiter, may I have another fortune cookie? I'd like a second opinion. <laughs> See, I live with the mystery and with incredible faith. It's the clear, discriminating awareness from which perfection just spreads before you. All of it. Thank you.